Hello. In this session, we're going to be talking about China's investment in technology, a snapshot of the priorities through 2040. My name is Peter Wood. I'm a program manager for Blue Path Labs. Um, I'm speaking here today on behalf of uh, our program, which uh, does open source, that does deep dive open source analyses of the PLA of Chinese uh, SNT and other defense topics. Um, the research I'm presenting here today is an early look at forthcoming research uh, prepared by myself and my colleague, Alex Stone. Blue Path Labs is a consultancy that uh, does a variety of open source research, uh, leveraging big data uh, and our team of OSINT language enabled analysts to provide a variety of services from research and analysis to consulting services um, and technological integration. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've done a variety of deep dive analyses, including of China's ballistic missile industry, of China's military civil fusion strategy, uh, China's ground segment, um, and other aspects of the PLA, largely for the China Aerospace Studies Institute. Now, to understand China's uh, priorities for technological development, um, really what you have to do is we're pulling together from a whole variety of the various documents uh, and, and plans and, uh, and national strategies that are, uh, that are put out by the PRC government, um, statements and speeches from senior officials. And, and to do that, um, we've combined all of these to really try to delve into what we believe are the uh, most significant areas of investment and uh, where and what, place, what things are placing the greatest priority on um, looking ahead. Um, the first of these, first group of these that we can talk about is national milestones. So the Chinese Communist Party places a lot of emphasis on several historical milestones, particularly the year 2021 and 2049. 2021 being the centenary of the founding of, of the CCP um, and, and 2049, which they regard, uh, which is obviously the uh, 100th anniversary of the founding of the PRC. Um, and also um, really what they regard as sort of uh, the end of the initial arc of China's development, since it will represent 100 years of, of national development. Um, the next group of these is the national strategies. These include Made in China 2025, the Innovation Driven Development Strategy, and Military Civil Fusion Strategy. These lay out um, a series of the longer term goals for the PRC um, and provide some insight as they uh, line up um, where China wants to be by certain key dates. Um, other plans, such as the medium to long term plan for development of SNT um, and uh, its forthcoming uh, uh, successor, which will cover 2021 to 2035, don't quite take us through 2040. But what these plans do offer is they, they lay out um, the what China calls mega projects. So massive uh, areas of investment, uh, which we'll get into in just a few minutes, focus areas for investment and are an attempt to achieve long-term and strategic effects uh, for China. Um, of China, of course, uh, has a whole series of national economic development plans, the most recent being the recently uh, released 14th five-year plan. Um, and these also uh, act as a important guideposts for where China is interested in going, not only because they set priorities for on five-year intervals, but also because they uh, include details about uh, laboratories and other national facilities um, that will be constructed during that period, which provides some indication of where China wants to be and what technologies it's placing priorities on. This slide provides sort of a brief overview of, of, uh, of statements drawn from official documents and speeches by senior Chinese leaders as to what they're attempting to do. So obviously by 2020 and 2021, um, there's a whole series of, of, of this, we're recently passing a, a series of important milestones, both on the domestic side, where China is trying to build a, what they call a moderately prosperous society, um, but also on defense side, where they're trying to, uh, you know, the, the PLA has obviously expanded quite dramatically in the past 20 years, um, but with underneath that, um, what they're trying to do is what they call um, uh, informatization, which means the uh, deployment of uh, sensors, communication systems to better network the PLA, but also even more basic things that perhaps other militaries might take for granted, such as mechanization. Um, China's 
probably achieved a uh, you know a very high uh, level of mechanization and some level of uh, informatization, particularly through the completion of the Beto um, DNSS, um, and also at the same time it greatly improved their strategic capabilities through uh, fielding such capabilities as a you know long range strategic bombers. Um, they're capable of uh, strategic strikes, a whole series of very advanced ballistic missiles, um, and also strategic transport, such as the Y-20. So they've made significant progress in some of these levels. At the same time, uh, other plans, such as Made in China 2025, um, that place that were primarily focused on the economic side, have uh, were more focused on uh, attempting to improve China's manufacturing capability. Um, and a key part of this is, you know, realizing self-sufficiency um, of core technologies. Um, looking at China's, you know, overall national strength, they're trying to obviously, you know, uh, see major breakthroughs across all these levels. And so when we look at what they're placing priorities on for in terms of technological development, we have to look at all three of these, uh, at all three of these sectors. Now, and this last one, the uh, economic area, something that we continue to see when examining Chinese uh, speeches by official, by, by top leaders, is that um, they're less happy with the progress in internalizing these uh, technologies, whether it's the ability to fully uh, to design on their own and then produce advanced uh, microchips, um, something we've seen the supply chain of um, significantly disrupted uh, during COVID. Um, but also even more basic technologies such as aero engines or, uh, or, or advanced electronics, um, things that, in, that other countries might take for granted, China is not particularly satisfied with its progress in terms of you know, reducing its reliance on imports from abroad. Um, for example, it's, it's still, uh, you know, relies entirely, uh, or relies significantly on imports of semiconductors uh, from abroad, and I believe that uh, the, the, the overall volume of that trade actually exceeds its imports of, of oil at this time. So point is, is that while, you know, across the board, whether it's, you know, socially or militarily, they've made significant progress, there are a number of these, you know, uh, milestones that they haven't necessarily met um, entirely. So looking ahead closer to the 2040 timeline, um, that's, you know, the kind of the, the focus of this area, um, we actually have official milestones on either side of that of that time. So 2035, for example, um, the PLA wants to uh, you know comprehensively you know make achievements in in uh, you know uh, modernization of its weaponry and equipment. Something I think that they're reasonably on track to 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 achieve. Um, and then what they would call basically complete modernization of national defense and the military, which includes a whole slew of things beyond simply equipment. Um, and also involves, you know, things like uh, the, uh, you know, uh, reorganization of their uh, of, of their entire military. Actually, the uh, adoption of the uh, theater command system, uh, improved training, um, things that have, while well, they've made major changes since uh, 2016 in particular, um, are not easy because you're talking about, you know, uh, large scale changes uh, across a massive organization. Um, but at the same time, though, they're clearly made, of, made major investments in uh, improving the equipment of the PLA. And so, you know, for example, we can reasonably expect that before 2040, that the PLA will continue to uh, make significant progress in this direction. Um, the bigger question is, and which I'll get to in a moment, is how will technology change in the interim? And really, as we look across the board, whether it's uh, the domestic development or economic development or military development, um, the, the PRC and, and the Chinese Communist Party are attempting to future-proof China. Um, and, by, and, and to do so, they're making heavy investments um, in, in the future. Because if, you know, for example, they've, as they've uh, stated that they want to do, they want to have a, you know, a vibrant, um, uh, strong, democratic, not in the way that the United States understands it, but at least advanced um, society, um, and, and be a you know, top manufacturing power with you know, advanced technology. Um, these are investments where, uh, or these are places where if they're going to you know, continue the progress that they've made um, and be able to keep up with other economies, um, they're gonna have to continue you know, to make major investments. They can't simply ride off of the uh, arc of rapid economic growth that they saw during you know, the 
after their ascension to the WTO in uh, 2000. So to dig a bit more specifically into uh, SNT, we can look at some of their SNT development plans. So this is from a, a plan that came, or a strategy that came out in 2016. Um, by 2020, you know, I think by by many metrics, you know, China is ranking in the has met their initial goal for for 2020, which is to you know join the rank of innovative countries. Um, but something that we've found as we've begun to dig into to data about their uh, uh, about the volume of uh, academic publications and things is that there's actually quite widespread dissatisfaction that uh, many Chinese scientists themselves are, are not actually that uh, satisfied with the uh, originality of a lot of that research. So uh, while if you're purely to look at certain metrics that I think are very popular, such as, again, publications, um, China's, the volume of them has certainly increased. I think if you dig below the surface, and as my colleague Alex has found, um, there are actually quite some significant issues uh, resting below the surface here. So this is not a development arc that I think that we can just take for granted. And it's very clear that the PRC is not doing that as well. Um, to get to 2035, um, or even as you know, their more lofty goal in 2050 of becoming a great gl uh, global great power um, in scientific research, um, these are not guaranteed by any means. Um, as uh, it says there on the slide, you know, Xi Jinping himself has said, you know, China must you know, seize the commanding heights of technological innovation. Um, they don't want to take their economic growth or um, for granted. And they realize that the things that fueled that growth in the past, uh, you know, whether it, it was, you know, assembling uh, things everyone knows made in China, um, or, you know, as domestic uh, consumption has kind of risen, um, they don't want to take these things as guarantees of the next stage of development. There's very clear emphasis, and, and I would even say alarm um, that is discernible when reading PRC state plans um, regarding China's need to move up the value chain in terms of the types of equipment and you know, products that it produces, um, but also to um, rely much less on uh, foreign ideas, um, imports, uh, or what they would call um, uh, you know, uh, indigenous uh, development or you know, the ad uh, adoption or replication of technologies and then improvement of those. Um, there is recognition that they need to move beyond that model. And, and I think that when you look at the, the reason why they have these innovation-driven um, development strategies and, and other similar plans, it is, uh, it's an attempt to uh, more broadly you know, begin to addre address that and, and to the degree that they can force change structurally um, to try to do that. A really important set of plans to, to talk about is the uh, medium to long-term plan for development of science and technologies. Um, you know, these cover uh, much longer periods than the, the five-year plans, obviously. And they have implications that, that are really you know, beyond the, our ability to predict uh, in, in terms of short-term technological forecasting, uh, because these are, uh, these are investments that they're making that, that, go, um, that are intended to be, again, strategic shifts um, where money and budget is allocated um, with the goal of, of, uh, uh, of, of achieving sort of strategic shifts. Um, we haven't yet, we haven't uh, had a, a public, uh, there is not a public version of the next medium to long-term plan, um, which will cover 2021 to 2035, coming up on that 2040 era. Um, but at the same time, the, the current MLP will, um, uh, will still have some implications, which we'll be talking to in a minute. Um, and while we wait for more details to be revealed on the new MLP, um, we can get a glimpse of what technology areas China is investing um, significantly on. Uh, based on R&D projects that are currently being funded. So S&T mega projects um, focus on product models, industries, and technologies um, on both the civilian and military sectors that are of strategic importance. Um, these are ambitious R&D undertakings that uh, involve enormous amount of investments. Um, some estimates say over 300 billion RMB um, and over 240,000 personnel uh, were involved in these over the past decade. Um, 
the current list of 16 public mega projects, which include manned space exploration, um, next generation wireless technology, uh, telecommunications technology, near space vehicle technology, et cetera. These were all laid out in 2006 um, with, an incomplete, with an anticipated completion date of, uh, uh, of, 20, of 2020. During the 13th five-year plan that uh, just ended in, uh, in 2020, uh, policymakers announced a new category of meta projects to be implemented between 2016 and 2030. So these, again, um, while they may seem, you know, less kind of uh, technologies of the future, these represent some of those core technologies I mentioned that, that China recognizes that it needs, needs to be able to, you know, fully indigenize to be able to achieve the, the next level of state economic development, um, such as air engines, gas turbines. Um, Quantum communication and computing, which I'll get into uh, in, in just a minute, is obviously um, much much more of these uh, you know cutting edge type technologies, brain science and brain inspired technology and artificial intelligence, uh, but also even you know things that we might take for granted, such as uh, you know cyberspace security um, or seed industry, independent innovation. Um, clearly, these goals are attend uh, uh, go across that range of you know domestic. Uh, domestic development, um, economic development, and then kind of longer term things with uh, defense applications. Um, and many of the, most of these, in fact, are actually dual use technologies. The latest five-year plan, the 14 five-year plan, called for achieving breakthroughs in seven frontiers of science and technologies, which none of which are, can be considered entirely new research directions, uh, but in fact represents, you know, continued investment in that. So it's almost like a subset of the previously identified set of, of projects um, are going to see continued investment. And that includes, of course, AI, not surprisingly, um, quantum, uh, quantum uh, technologies, um, integrated circuits, which I referred to earlier, uh, neuroscience, genetic and um, genetics and biotechnology, which have implications across the range of you know, public health um, uh, or to uh, uh, or you know, food security in the form of you know, better, uh, better crops, um, clinical me medicine, health and sciences, and also deep space, sea, and polar exploration. The interesting thing is when you look at authoritative uh, books or books that are written by uh, authors affiliated with the PLA, such as the Science of Military Strategy, the latest edition from 2020 that was published by China's National Defense University, we actually see that there's quite a bit of overlap in terms of these domains. Um, obviously, China is attempting to achieve significant um, breakthroughs in all these areas, but the PLA is also preparing to um, fight or carry out, uh, conf, you know, uh, carry out, uh, if not warfare, then at least be able to uh, compete in these domains, um, which range, of course, from space, which I think everyone is aware is, a, you know, an, uh, uh, increasingly a, an area of, of tensions between countries, um, cyber warfare, that were what China calls the network domain, um, but even more extreme environments, such as the deep ocean or polar regions, where uh, Chinese military thinkers and strategists are talking about uh, competition between states for, for resources, something we also hear a lot of in terms of, uh, you know, Russia talks a lot about this, um, but also biology and even cognition, um, which has been, uh, you know, quite a bit of emphasis in the PLA in terms of being able to um, not only compete as a state, but also have to having capabilities to operate in this. So, in the biological sphere, for example, the PLA is funding um, quite a lot of research into uh, genetic manipulation um, or looking at uh, you know, potential use of uh, biological applications for uh, um, human performance, but also even more mundane things. And in, 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 in so far as that uh, you know, food security or just you know, making resilient crops, um, should be and, and can be understood as, as part of, uh, of China's food security and an integral part of its uh, national security. So there's very much a broad approach to what is security and what needs to be funded for China to be a militarily strong, um, but also economically vibrant and competitive country. Um, and, and again, to be able to you know, be making the investments in these wide range of fields um, and sectors or frontiers, however you want to call it, um, so that uh, China does not fall behind. At the same time, we're also seeing um, major investment in what the, in the PRC's state laboratory system. And here I'm drawing on my colleague Alex's research. Um, 
that uh, China's investment in future S&T leadership can also be seen in, in these national laboratories and all and uh, other scientific research facilities. Um, China is actually in the middle of a complete uh, overhaul of its laboratory system. Um, with, uh, Blue Path Labs actually has a, uh, report, a forthcoming report that will be examining all of this. Uh, and uh, in my colleague's findings, um, she found that China currently has four officially approved national uh, laboratories, but has plans to build more during the 14 five-year plan, including in the areas of quantum information, photonics and micro nanoelectronics, network communications, artificial intelligence, biomedicine, uh, modern and uh, modern energy systems, which uh, covers a range of things from, uh, uh, you know, next generation um, renewable or clean technologies or, you know, uh, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen energy or even more advanced systems like uh, fusion. In addition to laboratories, there's also um, been major investment in uh, scientific research facilities. So these, you know, might be considered, you know, like a multi-billion dollar uh, programs and, and, and actual buildings and, and research architecture and research infrastructure. Um, something similar in the United States might be the uh, National Ignition Facility, which is being used to, to test the boundaries of, of modern um, fusion technology. Um, in many of these cases, these enormous facilities, which take up, you know, dozens of acres um, and again, cost billions and billions of dollars, um, are being built to, to explore energy. China itself is also quite interested in uh, looking at inertial confinement fusion and other next generation energy development technologies, um, but also life sciences, earth systems, environment, material science, uh, which is something that uh, they're particularly interested in, particle physics, nuclear physics, um, space and astronomy, and, and engineering technology. Um, my colleagues found is that as of 2021, uh, 27 of these facilities are currently operation, but more are under construction. So these are not these are not the kind of facilities that have an immediate uh, you know payoff. This isn't something you build it and you're expecting you know to have a um, a new discovery within a year. So these are the things that on the timeline of 2040 are going to be where the these longer term payoffs are going to be seen, um, where. China is, is, make, is, is recognizing that if it wants to win the future, as some people have said, it has to you know, bite the bullet now and uh, incur these costs and, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and again, begin doing research on these topics. We've also got, um, there are some documents that uh, my colleagues have gathered that actually look at what the kind of subset of defense technologies that China is most interested in are. Obviously, artificial intelligence is right up there, advanced materials, which could include metamaterials, um, but also uh, you know, heat resistant materials, things you, may not, you might use in a reentry vehicle shield for a space plane or a ballistic missile, um, advanced manufacturing to increase the uh, efficiency and precision, um, advanced structures, energy, direct, in particular, directed energy, um, which I think uh, all countries are making major investments in as they you know, recognize that as energy storage and generation improve, um, the ability to have a, uh, you know, um, to have directed energy, uh, whether it's a laser or jamming technology is gonna be uh, very, very important across the range of defending against UAVs or potentially you know, dazzling satellites. Um, that in particular is, appears to be of major interest to China, but also even um, you know, more, uh, more mundane refinements of some existing technology, such as target detection, using artificial intelligence to, uh, you know, on one hand, help China sift through a much vaster set of information um, much more quickly, um, but find targets with uh, in satellite imagery or using or, or uh, detect more uh, significant information from signals collection, things like that. Um, but again, here we even see that you know advanced electronics and components. This this idea that Again and again, China considers itself a, you know, uh, considers developing um, its own indigenous uh, electronics components, whether it's a uh, digital signal processing chips um, or, you know, the uh, types of uh, types of chips that are used to power AI uh, or even particular, or even um, uh, sensors and these, these kinds of technologies, China is attempting to uh, 
ensure that it doesn't rely on uh, overseas uh, suppliers for these um, as part of its kind of view of, of security. So when we kind of take a step back and look at uh, the where the common areas are between uh, national defense priorities and civilian or you know economic development um, type priorities for for technology, um, we see a couple of commonalities. They include, of course, artificial intelligence and brain inspired technology, um, quantum information, which uh, includes it's kind of a broader term for communications, computing, and, and sensing, which I'll speak on a bit more in just a moment. Genetics and bioscience. Um, future communications network, um, but also the ability to um, operate in multiple domains. China um, has a very rapid launch tempo for, for space um, and has obviously you know, fielded a, uh, uh, you know, Mars rovers and other things. So that's, it's got a very active civilian space program, um, but obviously there is uh, major implications for the military as it begins to field even you know, greater uh, or larger and more sophisticated and more resilient communication networks or uh, uh, constellations of reconnaissance satellites. Um, but again, high-end manufacturing there, which um, as we've seen in, in prior uh, studies of China's aerospace industry, for example, um, you know, really over the past 20 years, there's been uh, you know, significant improvements in their ability to you know, even have basic technologies such as digital design software or digital modeling software uh, you know, that allow um, the development of, of, of newer fighter jets and, and transports. Uh, but even at this, you know, even 20 years later, really, um, you know, after, after China's economic, economy really started to take off, uh, the, the PRC is still lagging behind this. So again, this is something where we see you know, senior scientists uh, saying again and again, we need to continue to make uh, improvements to uh, not only our ability to manufacture things more quickly, but also the design softwares, um, technologies like that uh, remain a priority for them. Um, real quickly, before I kind of wrap up, I'm going to talk about uh, a, a few of these technologies in a bit more detail, just to kind of give a snapshot of where they are and how, what their progress has been. Um, so we can, you know, perhaps have a better understanding of where they might be in by 2040. Um, the first of these is applied quantum-based technology. So uh, Academici and Guo Guangtan, um, you know, noted that whoever builds quantum computers first will occupy the global technological innovation high ground. Um, that I think should, you know, you know, make it clear just how much they prioritize the development of these technologies, which um, range from communications. Um, computing and also sensing. Um, I'm not a quantum scientist, uh, and I'm, and I'm uh, I will try not to, to mess this up. But what we can see, what I read, what I see from from reading Chinese documents and and news media coverage and and speeches by Chinese leaders or scientific figures talking about these programs is that they they see um, significant advantages um, uh, from quantum computing for a number of obviously civilian applications, but also military applications. Um, improvements to machine learning, for example, um, if they were able to apply quantum computing, which for certain types of computing has uh, the potential to you know, increase them beyond what uh, you know, uh, Moore's law and the uh, traditional improvements to CPU speeds, for example, have or semiconductor speeds um, have, uh, have allowed um, to be able to go beyond that. Um, more militarily directed is the ability to actually crack adversary encryption, uh, which could obviously be a, a huge breakthrough for, for China, uh, or if its opponents were able to get there first, um, would represent a massive breakthrough as well for them. Um, but also uh, quantum sensing, um, as China's likely adversaries uh, have made major investments in stealth technologies um, and, and uh, you know, and China is attempting to negate those advantages. There has been some interest in, in looking at and how quantum properties might be used, whether it's for detecting stealth aircraft or uh, in other mediums, perhaps even detecting submarines. Um, a lot of that technology appears to be in sort of early stages, but the strategic payoff could be immense. And I think those are the kinds of things that uh, 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 Dr. Guo was, was talking about. Um, as kind of a, 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 a note of just how much emphasis being placed on this, you know, the National Laboratory for Quantum Information Scientists, you know, was, in, uh, was established with, uh, at a cost of, of 10 billion uh, USD in 2017. 
And uh, Pan Jian, Dr. Pan Jian Wei, who's a leader for across a range of these uh, programs, has uh, been majorly involved in not only development of a uh, the world's most powerful quantum computer, at least as of, uh, far as I'm aware at the moment, uh, um, in June 2021, but also in a range of very interesting uh, programs to improve the security of China's communications, which include uh, 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 earth to ground, uh, or basically essentially using satellites and ground-based facilities to uh, using quantum technologies to secure the links between a satellite and ground-based systems or between two separate ground-based systems um, using what's called a quantum key distribution. So China very, un, you know, uh, very understandably has major concerns about the security of its communications. And uh, particularly uh, as Elsa Kania and other people have noted that uh, after uh, the revelations from Edward Snowden, I think that there was you know, significant in, uh, increase in, in their desire to, you know, okay, we need to fundamentally secure our communications uh, and quantum appeared to be one of the best ways to do that. And so, as you can see in this, this map that I put together, they've actually um, built a whole series of ground stations all across China and then have tested using quantum entanglement properties uh, to, to be able to change and to be able to transfer information between these uh, points, uh, uh, you know, including one, uh, so one, uh, one test uh, involved two ground stations that were over a thousand kilometers apart and also testing between ground stations and satellites. Uh, because if they're able to do that, of course, then they'll be less vulnerable to interception or decryption. Artificial intelligence uh, is also another one of these technologies that I, I think I think it's fair to say that the PRC scientists regard as if they fall too far behind, there's a potential of losing uh, out longer term. Uh, China often talks about what they call a systems confrontation, the idea that that you know it and other countries around the world are engaged in a uh, really a competition that, that, that pits the entirety of their, 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 their political system, their economy, the brilliance of their scientists, all of these things are being pitted against each other. And for technologies like quantum and, and, and artificial intelligence, you see similar kinds of statements from, from top scientists or even from you know, top leaders like Xi Jinping saying, we have to get these right Otherwise, it's going to be disastrous for us longer term. And so really, there is going to be a race to through 2040 to get these technologies um, or to, to, to make major breakthroughs in these technologies. And I think, you know, Joji, I think he said this in um, uh, 2018, um, really that, you know, this is the AI will be the most important dual use technology, acknowledging that um, whoever is able to successfully field artificial intelligence uh, across you know, the, the range of, of various types of AI that there are um, is much more likely to be successful um, in this kind of systems confrontation. So to talk real quickly about some of the defense applications that we see in, in PLA literature about this, um, we know that the PLA has, been, has had some issues you know, absorbing the volume of data you know, being created by all the various new platforms. As uh, you know, China has uh, fielded a uh, wide range of very capable satellites, uh, UAVs. Um, but as all this new data becomes available, you know, creating, you can only reorganizing your system to be more efficient, you know, the moving people around and, you know, creating um, data fusion centers or intelligence fusion centers, which is a, a, something that they've done, um, can only get you so far. To actually be able to parse through all of that effectively, you're going to need machine learning and, and other applications like that. So whereas it's you know not as interesting as as you know for example a you know more autonomous vehicle, um, breakthroughs in machine learning and and some technologies like this are going to be essential for China to be competitive going forward, uh, and uh, and artificial intelligence is you know no surprise than a a massive um, uh, uh, a you know one of the top listed priorities for both the civilian economy um, and also for defense. Um, we're also seeing, um, as some research by uh, Nathan Oshant Mustafaga and others have found, there's been some you know, very interesting 
uh, research looking at how the PLA is actually even talking about using artificial intelligence for information operations, um, you know, to better automate its ability to, to compete in what it calls the, the cognitive domain. Um, you know, uh, when we're talking about social media, we always talk about, uh, you know, grabbing people's eyeballs, but in, in a real way that, you know, China wants to be able to both domestically and externally uh, manipulate the information environment. And one of the ways to do that is to leverage artificial intelligence. At the same time, there is, uh, you know, looking at future discussions of what the PLA wants to achieve. Uh, uh, essential component of that is what they call um, intelligenceization, or, you know, the ability to be able to fight intelligent wars. Um, some of their futurists, um, actually, you know, such as Wu Mingxi, who actually wrote a book called Intelligent Wars, um, have actually talked about what these kinds of conflicts would um, would involve, and uh, and in his mind, while the while there is while the, the humans remain in the loop um, and, and play a significant role, there are there's a much greater emphasis on controlled use of of swarms, or you know, talking on a kind of a range, you know, to the twenty thirty or the twenty forty timeline, the there's simply it's the, the speed at which conflict is gonna happen is going to move beyond the uh, ability for, um, for unaugmented people or, or people without the benefit of artificial intelligence and, um, and semi-autonomous or autonomous systems uh, to be able to be effective. Um, that, that chain of collecting data, uh, analyzing it, and then responding uh, across all the various domains that I mentioned before, you know, whether it's the network domain or, you know, electronic warfare domain, um, space and, uh, uh, and air, all of the action is going to be happening in these domains at such a speed that without these kinds of, uh, of technologies to support operations, you're simply not going to be competitive. Um, and while, um, and, 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 to, and to bring it back to the civilian economy, which of course is, you know, another you know, another kind of uh, core component of, of why China is investing so heavily in there is that um, China wants to have a, you know, competitive society that wants to be able to have a, a strong military that will be able to uh, compete with its adversaries um, across all of these uh, technologies. Uh, but it also wants to have a, a, you know, economy that, you know, is, is, is survivable in a future that, that, it, that has artificial intelligence and where, you know, uh, many types of jobs will likely go away. So looking again ac across the board, um, we'll try to emphasize on the, on the latter end of this presentation on, on the more military applications, you know, we really see this uh, strong emphasis on artificial intelligence, but also uh, artificial intelligence and in in, in quantum technologies, but also um, more emerging domains, places or things like, you know, biology where, uh, the implications may be less directly military, but at the same time, the in, in terms of improving the strength of China's overall system, its its economy, the uh, the uh, the ability of its of its people to continue to to, to find uh, to have you know uh, jobs and contribute to the economy, or even you know something as simple as as health, um, improving the 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 uh, overall situation of China's healthcare can actually improve its its overall economic vibrancy and, and the strength of the economy. So um, prognostication is hard, uh, but I think that this collection of, of plans, milestones, um, and strategies do give us some kind of insight into what these, uh, into what China wants and where it will be in 2040. Thank you.